Assalamu alaikum. We are here uh, with Sayyid Suleiman Hassan on the topic of the role of the divinely appointed Imams uh, within the Shi'i school of Islam. So, Sayyid, um, I'll go ahead and introduce the topic, and inshallah, thereafter we'll have some questions for you to enlighten us on. So, in accordance with the Imami Shi'i interpretation of Islam, the Prophet Muhammad was succeeded by divinely appointed successors from amongst his progeny which are known as the Imams of the Ahlul Bayt. These Imams guided the Muslim community by infallibly preserving and disseminating the teachings of Islam. But during the 9th century, however, the 12th Shi'i uh, Imam السلام, went into a state of occultation. And sometimes what it is said is that the followers of, of the Imam, known as the, the Shia, they went through an epistemic crisis with regards to knowledge and, and authority. So, a few questions follow. What is the role of the Imam in relation to knowledge? Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Thank you for the opportunity to, to discuss these issues, and uh, I hope that we'll be able to gain some insight into uh, the relationship of uh, a believer with Allah, which, as understood in Shi Islam, uh, is something that is informed by the relationship of a believer to the Prophet, to the Imam, uh, or more broadly speaking, through the relationship of a believer to revelation. Uh, in the Shi'i conception, the finality of Prophethood means that the, uh, the Prophet Muhammad وآله, was the last Prophet, but that authentic and genuine knowledge that is inspired by Allah, that is guaranteed by Allah uh, as being correct, that did not come to an end with the Prophet. And so, at least historically speaking, we can say that one of the first roles of Imam Ali, of, of the Imam, was to uh, assert what was authentically the application of the Prophet's teachings. The Prophet brought certain changes in society uh, religiously, spiritually, ethically, legally, uh, socially. There were many different changes that, that came in the Prophet's teachings. And even if we say that the essence of those changes was preserved by the broader Muslim community, companions of the Prophet all observed him praying, uh, fasting, uh, his methodology in warfare, his methodology in making peace, and so on. Uh, Clearly, in that short space of time that the Prophet had between when some of those teachings were, uh, were first publicly announced and the uh, Prophet's death uh, less than uh, four or five years after some of those teachings had been announced, in some cases uh, a little bit longer, uh, the relative priority of the teachings of the Prophet had not been clearly established by the Prophet himself. So, for example, prayer uh, and devotion and worship in general are clearly a very important part of uh, the uh, Islamic Sharia and, uh, and the Muslim's life. Uh, defense of the religion uh, and the, um, the application of political authority in order to affirm uh, Islamic values and Islamic teachings that was important. But how was that to be done? What is the relative importance of unity, for example, of the Muslim community versus maintaining the ideal of piety and knowledge for a person who is going to be the leader of a congregational prayer or the leader of a Friday sermon? Now, those were issues uh, when it comes to the, the relationship of different Islamic teachings, the relative priority of the Islamic teachings that the Prophet had not been able to spell out in detail. Uh, I think it would be fair to say that the first historical role of the Imam, uh, represented in the person of Imam Ali, was to say that this is how this teaching of Islam is to be applied in society. 
an example that we have from, from the very first days of Islam uh, is the punishments for certain sins and certain transgressions, where the caliph sometimes felt that it was good to punish people uh, publicly, uh, even if uh, there may have been extenuating circumstances. Uh, whereas the, uh, uh, the teaching of Imam Ali and his practice during the time of his own caliphate, his assertion during the time of the previous caliphs, was that Islam never intended those harsh punishments to be something that were going to be carried out with regularity. Uh, there are uh, many steps that might prevent a person from actually being punished for adultery uh, or punished for uh, a grave sin. And the, uh, the, uh, the honor of Islam does not lie in carrying out the punishment uh, necessarily. It lies in affirming that that punishment was revealed by God and if those circumstances are met, it should be carried out. But if there are extenuating circumstances, if the person uh, may not have the crime proved, or if they may have repented, or, uh, or for other reasons, then the honor of Islam lies, the proper application of Islamic teaching lies, in not carrying out that punishment. So that's one example that we have, uh, among many others, uh, where... The, uh, the role of the imam was to maintain the right priority of teachings that in the end were known to those who did not believe in the imam and those who did follow Ahlul Bayt as divinely appointed imams. Okay. And, and how does this divine appointmentship of the imam and, and how is how he determine the priorities of, of application of the law or what was priority in terms of, of conveying the principles of knowledge. How does that relate to the, the, the role of scholastic knowledge and the role of the scholars? If you could speak a little bit on that. And, well, this was uh, one of the first challenges that, that confronted the Imams uh, was that uh, there were teachings which were known to have come from the Prophet uh, but may have been misunderstood, or the importance or the relative importance and the relationship of those teachings may have been misunderstood. Uh, another example that we could give is the way in which the nawafil, the recommended non-obligatory acts of worship, like uh, the recommended prayers in the month of Ramadan, were to be performed, uh, where the caliphs brought people together to do so in congregation. And Imam Ali and the later Imams asserted that was not to be done. But that is part of a uh, much more comprehensive role which the Imams fulfilled, which was to, in some cases, uh, provide that information about the relative priority of, of Islamic teachings, in other cases to inform people of uh, Islamic teachings that they would have no other way of knowing about no other way of having access to, if not for the imams. Uh, which does not mean to bring a new sharia, uh, but it means to inform people uh, about uh, especially spiritual and ethical and, uh, and doctrinal issues that they would not be able to know of or know of conclusively without that guidance of the imam. And what combines both of those roles is that the imam had knowledge that was guaranteed by Allah to be unerring, to be authentic, to be genuine. So an imam would uh, issue a ruling, would, would uh, uh, express something that in some cases people would see of as an opinion. It would sometimes be called a ra'i, a, a opinion. But uh, from the perspective of the imams and their followers, it wasn't a ra'i, as a scholar would, would express an opinion or issue a ruling. Uh, it was an authentic exposition, an authentic explanation of Islam's teaching on that issue. 
in whatever area it was. The relationship of the imam's learning to scholarship is very similar to the relationship of the prophet's teaching to scholarship. You will always need scholars to convey, to preserve, to interpret, uh, and to contextualize the teaching of the prophet or the teaching of the imam. Uh, but the difference is that when the prophet says something or when the imam says something, that itself is not seen as one person's attempt at understanding, interpreting, contextualizing, or preserving uh, a teaching that is authentic. That is seen as something which uh, has been guaranteed and been preserved by a divine promise, by a guarantee from Allah. Uh, that might seem to imply uh, that the imam is similar to, to a prophet, and in one sense the imam is, uh, in the sense that their exposition, their words, uh, and their lives are uh, infallible. But the key difference and the main difference is that uh, the prophet will express or will convey uh, a new sharia the prophet of Islam brought uh, the imams will simply be uh, preservers and explainers of that revelation and that uh, system of life that was brought by the prophet they will not abrogate or bring a new sharia okay and if I can backtrack a little bit to the to the point you had made, if I understood you correctly, that the actual conception and teachings theologically of Shiism and the Imam were not always necessarily conceived that way in the broader Muslim community. So, for example, you mentioned that sometimes someone might have taken Imam Ali alayhi salam his word as an opinion or an assessment of his own, while the broader teachings of Islam would say, or of Shiism rather. Uh, within Islam would say that this is actually a word of an imam and it's authoritative, it's genuine. And how do we understand that discrepancy? That's an excellent question. And it's a point that's often uh, ignored, actually, uh, or underappreciated. Uh, the imams did not function in society only as imams, in the sense that they only had a message to people who believed in them as infallible and divinely appointed guides. Uh, for example, Imam Ali is widely credited uh, by Muslims of all schools of thought, all of the legal schools, as having uh, initiated the ruling that the punishment for intoxication in Islam is to be 80 lashes. Now, the uh, Sunni community uh, may largely say, or uh, they, they may hold the opinion that this was done by analogy, uh, that the punishment for uh, for uh, the, uh, the leveling of a false accusation against a, a Muslim is 80 lashes, as mentioned in the Quran, Abdul Qad. And Imam Ali reasoned by analogy that when a person becomes intoxicated, they make and they level false accusations, and so it's at that same level, and that should be the punishment. And then that was affirmed by the consensus, the ijma of the companions of that time. Uh, from a Shi'i perspective, of course, uh, even if that might be the superficial uh, progression of the issue historically, that would not be the theological explanation. Uh, but if the Imam expressed an opinion of that nature, then it would be seen as an explanation of what the Sharia of Islam had always intended, and perhaps the Prophet had actually expressed, uh, but people were not aware of. So there was certainly a role that, uh, that uh, virtually all of the imams played uh, in society uh, where they did speak to people uh, according to uh, their understanding. And we're not talking about taqiyya here where the imams might have given an answer that would have been different from uh, their actual ruling uh, in order to protect the well-being of, uh, of uh, their followers. Uh, but we're speaking about the fact that the Imams would uh, acknowledge that many of the Muslims did not have an understanding of Isma, did not have an understanding of Imamah, and the Imams would actually provide 
guidance and instruction uh, to them as well. Uh, there is a hadith where a follower of, uh, I believe it was Imam Ja'far Sadiq came to the Imam and said that uh, when I answer people's questions, if I know that a person is a follower of the Imam, then I will give them the answer that I have heard from you or from your forefathers, uh, the previous Imams. If I know that somebody is an opponent or follows an opposing school of, of law, then I give them an answer based on their school of law. And if I don't know, then I mention what the opinion of Ahlul Bayt is, the opinion that has come to me from the Imams, and also the opinion that is found in other schools of law. And the Imam gave an answer which not only affirmed that practice, but he said that I do the same thing. That when I give answers to people, I answer them in exactly the same way. And so that's an important point, that the Imams did have a relationship, an intellectual relationship, uh, and a relationship of guidance uh, with people who did not accept them as Imams. It's important for us to, to be aware of that fact and not to only think of the Imams in terms of their Isma, because that would be ignoring or de-emphasizing an important part of uh, the message and the efforts of the Imams themselves. Much of the sermons of uh, Imam Ali that we read in Nahjul Balagha, many of the, the words of Imam Hussain that we can read uh, in uh, his journey to Karbala can be seen in this light. They're not expressing the profundities of doctrine or theology which the Imams may have taught to people who were intellectually and spiritually ready to hear that message. But they were a message that was intended for a broader audience as well. It's valid, but it would be a mistake to think that is the extent of what the Imams taught. It would also be a mistake to uh, ignore this dimension of the Imams' teachings and only focus on the message which they gave to people who recognized and believed in their imamat. And both of those dimensions are important. Okay. And uh, this question is, is, is especially pertinent in the, in the time of occultation when we don't have uh, necessarily direct access to an imam. Uh, and the question is about uh, our role uh, with scholars and, and the knowledge that they convey. What is the nature of that knowledge and how should we be thinking about that? Uh, for some people, it might seem as if when the imam is not directly accessible to a person, then there's no difference between a person who believes in an imam and a person who doesn't believe in an imam. And in one superficial sense, that is somewhat accurate, uh, that uh, a scholarship uh, will depend on reasoning and deduction and uh, uh, making a good faith effort to determine answers to questions. And that is something that uh, all schools of thought, all schools of law within Islam will do. They might have different sources. And so uh, a person who is a follower of Ahlul Bayt could argue uh, with justification that we have better sources, more complete sources, more comprehensive and uh, more harmonious sources that give us uh, guidance about the, the uh, teachings of Islam. But Regardless of that point, the process of scholarship derivation and the fact that it is not conclusive is conclusive in a uh, epistemic sense uh, is accurate. The main difference is conceptual. That uh, the school of Ahlul Bayt teaches and believes that the importance of revelation is not simply in bringing a new sharia, in bringing a new law, or bringing a new divine book. That is one of the jo jobs of a prophet. That wasn't the job of all prophets. Not every prophet brought a new revealed book. Not every prophet brought uh, a new law. And the role of religion and revelation is tied together with authentic and divinely inspired knowledge. When it comes to law, when it comes to beliefs and doctrine, when it comes to ethics, spirituality, 
uh, irfan or gnosis, any area of life, religion can only fulfill its mission if it provides an answer or a mechanism for there to be an answer that is authentic, that a person uh, can uh, believe in, can follow, can practice, that comes from God. Shia Islam believes uh, that through the Imams, that tradition of authentic knowledge was preserved after the Prophet, within the Sharia of the Prophet, within the teachings and the revelation and the, the revealed book that was conveyed by the Prophet, that tradition continues. And that is going to be in the future, and it is conceptually at all times uh, the source of Islam fulfilling its promise. So we might temporarily and provisionally not have access to our imam. And when we don't have access to our imam, then we have to make do with scholarship that is fallible. We have to make do with provisional answers. That temporary state might be centuries, it might be eons, but conceptually it is a provisional state. The role of religion, the fulfillment of religion's promise, that is still based on authentic and genuine knowledge that is correct, that is infallible, that is guaranteed by Allah. And that is uh, what we believe to be the, the principle that Islam is calling us towards. That is where we see the fulfillment of our religious purpose. And it gives us a great deal of humility uh, with regard to challenges or questions or circumstances that we might face in our life. We don't have to, uh, to have a conclusive answer because there is an imam who has the conclusive answer, who has the hujjah of Allah, the authoritative answer, which he will disclose, which Allah will disclose at a time uh, of his choosing, in accordance with his wisdom. If you don't believe in an imam, then that door is closed. And so, not just in terms of uh, provisional answers, but conceptually as well. Uh, there will not be conclusive and authentic answers for many questions, for any question that is not explicitly contained or clearly contained in uh, the Qur'an uh, or in the reported sayings and practices of the Prophet. And that is a very limited uh, sphere. And so Islam will end up becoming limited. And, and I imagine that um, the provisional nature of of, of, of scholarship, uh, as important as it might be, um, I suppose that this might lead to the natural differences of opinion that we see today amongst fuqaha, um, and, I'm, and perhaps the differences are minor, or, or in some cases major. Maybe you can speak to that a little the, bit. The difference of opinion, that's a, that's a fair question that is often raised. Uh, for many uh, individuals, uh, religion only makes sense if there is one answer. Uh, but uh, if you look at the Qur'an, uh, the Qur'an is very comfortable with the existence of difference of opinion. Uh, the Qur'an says that uh, Allah will tell us uh, about many things that we differed on the Day of Judgment, uh, that we are to uh, send back uh, or refer areas of dispute to God and to His Prophet. So. The fact that there are differences of opinion, that somebody might consider a particular food halal and another food haram, that somebody might consider a particular day to be Eid, and therefore it's haram to fast, another person might consider it to be uh, the last day of the month of Ramadan, and therefore it's obligatory to fast, that is not a problem. Right? What is important is that we have the right process, that we can stand before Allah on the Day of Judgment and say that you sent commandments and teachings, and... I did my best to make sure that I fulfilled my obligation in the right way. Now, I ended up, for example, supporting a political movement that might not have actually been uh, the best choice. I ended up uh, following a religious practice that might not have been correct. What's important is the process. And uh, the reality is that 
Allah created humanity. He created us with our intellect and all of the faculties that go into our soul and into our existence. And therefore, as our creator, he knows that that difference of opinion is something that is natural and unavoidable. And so what is of primary importance is that we have uh, the right process in navigating those differences. So Sayyid, if, if it is the case that the Qur'an is relatively comfortable with some differences of opinion, uh, I imagine within some larger framework, but if that is the case, then how do we reconcile that with what you mentioned earlier, which is that the Imam would be able to provide an authoritative, clear, definitive answer? Uh, yeah, that's an important point, not just about the, about the Imam, but about the Prophet himself. A prophet uh, might not disclose everything that he is able to disclose. In fact, the Quran explicitly says about Prophet Isa uh, that he was sent with the mission to tell people part of what uh, was a matter of dispute among them. And I believe that's reflected in the Gospels as well, uh, that, uh, that uh, even Christians would accept that, that Jesus did not claim uh, to answer every relevant question, but he left some unanswered to be clarified at a future time. And the Quran states that as well. So even a prophet uh, may have the ability and the knowledge to answer certain questions, but will not do so uh, because this world is a world uh, of uh, testing. And that test that Allah gives us is not just physical. It's not just about poverty and wealth. It's not just about health and sickness. But the poverty, all, the test also uh, applies to our thinking, our intellect. And how are we going to resolve intellectual and moral questions that we have? And so just as prophets and the prophet of Islam as well, uh, again, not to refer to uh, sources from the school of Ahlul Bayt, but even uh, the broader Muslim community has a hadith that the Prophet uh, did not do certain things because his people were, until very recently, mushrik. They were polytheists. For example, he didn't reconstruct the Kaaba according to the way it was built by Ibrahim and Ismail السلام, because his people were, uh, uh, were polytheists until recently. They might not be able to, uh, to bear that. So if the Prophet would not change certain physical things because of what his people were ready to bear, certainly many intellectual, many uh, moral concepts, uh, the Prophet would not be able to express in that situation uh, in a way that he might otherwise be able to express and actually do so. The same thing applies to the Imam. And perhaps that is one of the reasons why Allah did uh, test uh, the believers with a period of ghaybah, with a period of absence of the imam, uh, in order to uh, put us through our paces, have us use our intellectual resources, and uh, potentially realize that there are some questions that we can answer with our intellect, with our experience, with our own devices. And then there are certain questions, uh, there are certain uh, problems in, in life, not only intellectual questions, that we cannot answer without having a, an imam, a divinely appointed leader in our midst. And so uh, the belief that the divinely appointed leader, whether it be a prophet, whether it be a messenger, an imam, uh, has the ability to provide conclusive answers, does not mean that they will always do so. Part of the test of a believer is uh, not always to have access to that. And that might be the case even if the prophet is present, if the imam is present. It certainly is the case if the imam uh, is uh, in ghayba and is not directly accessible to us. Okay. Thank you so much for that, Sayyid. Um, it looks like there are quite a few uh, other questions that we could follow up with, with regards to taqlid or the nature of our relationship with scholars and 
and uh, perhaps what kind of vision we should have as 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 a, as a community in the time of occultation. Uh, many things come to mind, but inshallah, I think we'll have to follow up with you, uh, inshallah, for a future uh, interview. And uh, once again, I thank you so much for your time. And uh, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you for the opportunity.